So now, if you were here last week, you will remember that we talked about the Shema. If you weren't here last week, you may be scratching your head. So let me very quickly go through some review. So last week we looked at the three separate scriptures in the Old Testament that contain what the Hebrew people or the Jewish people would call the Shema. Those three scriptures, as I said, are on the back of that sheet. Uh, the main one is that Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. That's what they talk about when they say Shema, when they refer to the Shema. And the Shema is the Hebrew word for what we would call here, which is the first word in that scripture. Um, why we should study it, we talked about this a little bit, how it connects us to the, our Old Testament roots as a Christian faith. Um, it, it offers a foundation. It helps us to focus on God. We can use it almost as a meditation or a centering prayer. We talked last week about how the Jewish people uh, use it today, uh, different ways that they do, and then the meaning, which was hear, listen, pay attention. Tonight, we're going to look at two more words in that two verses of Scripture. We're going to look at Lord, or Lord your God, if, if you will look at a phrase, and love, how those two words are translated. And then next week, we'll, Robert will take us through three words, heart, soul, and strength. Now, might be smart for us to start out by looking at what the Shema is, once again. So, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. That's what the Shema is. It is a central scripture for the Jewish people. It's the most important one to them. You may remember a story from the Gospels where teachers of the law came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? And how did he answer that question? With this scripture. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul. He added mind and all of your strength. And then he added another one onto it. The second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is a very, very important, big deal scripture for the Jewish people, and it should be for us as well. It could almost be used like Christians would use the Lord's Prayer, or some denominations will recite the Apostles' Creed. I mean, it, it almost could be thought of in that sense. So now, I'm going to put you to work. You've only got five minutes, but I want you, and this is on your sheet, I want you to list different meanings that you can think of for the word Lord. And you can think of it as a noun or a verb, either one. And then I want you to list different meanings for the word love. You can talk amongst yourselves. Go. Okay, we're going to move on. Now, the purpose of that exercise, why is it not working, Ron? There we go. Whoop. Yeah, that's what I want. The purpose of that exercise was not to get you to report back to me, but to get your mind going about what those two words mean. Because the first thing we're going to do tonight is listen to a video by Rabbi Lizzie Heidemann about what is the Shema. And this video is one that Karen found, and we both just loved it. Um, it. The Shema is the most important prayer in Judaism, and it is recited often multiple times a day, reaffirming the Jewish people to their Judaism. Learning the meaning behind the most important Jewish prayer in this video, featuring Rabbi Heidemann, 
She is the founder of the Mishkan Chicago, and this video was created by a group of rabbis to uh, break down some of the major uh, prayers and, and rituals that are practiced in Jewish services today to help people become more of uh, people who are not Jewish become more familiar with Jewish things if and more comfortable if they were to go to worship. So I'm going to ask Ron to go ahead and start this video for us. Do you believe in God? Trick question. A relationship with God isn't about what you believe. It's about how you love and how you listen. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. We say it every day, twice a day, in the evening and morning, when you lie down and when you rise up. The simple reason is because the Bible says so. But listen. Shema Yisrael, listen, people of Israel. Shema Yisrael, listen, you descendants of Israel. Israel, the name given to Jacob after he wrestled an angel. Listen, you God wrestlers that powerful force that pervades the universe, that guides the stars in the sky and breathes divine breath through every blade of grass that flutters in the wind, that Mother Earth, that life force of all that is, is God. The letters that spell God's name in Hebrew can't actually be pronounced. So sometimes as a stand-in for that unsayable word, we'll use metaphors like Adonai, which means Lord. Some people say Hashem, which means the name. But when we say these words, we're really just pointing at what we can't say. Because the closest thing to speaking God's name out loud is breathing. That name, that universal heart beating through all that is, is one. And we remind ourselves every day that we are connected through that oneness. But oneness can feel a little bit abstract. How can we get to know this unsayable universal life force? The way that people have come to know deep truths forever, by paying attention, by listening. So Shema, listen up people. But listening is hard. So often we're distracted or feel pressure to have the answers and just close down, waiting for our turn to speak. So before we say the Shema, we say another prayer that reminds us that we can relax. We come in a long line of listeners. The prayer right before the Shema is called Ahava Rabba, big love, deep love, abundant, overwhelming, sweep you off your feet and knock you over with love, love. Because that's the kind of love that God had for our ancestors and has for us. But we're so often too busy to even notice. So notice, the prayer says, notice that you are surrounded by, infused with, kept in life by love, God's love, that beating heart of the universe. Pay attention. God, you taught our ancestors your laws and ways, quirky, special Jewish ways that connect us with our roots and give us wings. So we ask God, teach us, help us learn and understand, help us listen, and through listening, help us feel your love. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Okay, true confession. I was supposed to tell you to jot down notes before we showed that video, and I forgot. But what... What did you learn from what she said? What stood out to you? Listen, the importance of listening. You're going to have to talk louder, Drew, because I can't even hear you up here. Hang on, I think Ron's coming after you with a microphone. How when we say the names in the prayer that we're not really saying the name of God because we can't say the name mm -hmm. of God. We can't say the name of God. Mm 
Anybody else? Yeah, that was neat, wasn't it? Okay, we're going to do another video. This time I am going to tell you. Jot down. I want you to think about it. We're going to look at two videos tonight. I'm going to give Ron time to get the first one queued up. This is from the Bible Project. We looked at the first one last week, which looked at the word Shema. And this one looks at the word that is translated Lord. We're going to talk about this a little bit more um, when after, after we watch this video. So listen up. Make yourself some notes. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the second key word here, Lord, written in all capital letters. This is the personal name of Israel's God. We first learn the meaning of this name in the story of Moses and the burning bush in the book of Exodus chapter three. God appears to Moses and he commissions him to liberate the Israelites from slavery. And so Moses wonders, what if people ask the name of the God who has sent me? And so God responds, tell them Ehyeh has sent me to you. Now that Hebrew word Ehyeh means I will be. In other words, God's name means that he is the one who is and who will be. God's existence doesn't depend on anyone or anything else. This God simply is. But it will sound kind of strange for Moses to go say to the Israelites, I will be has sent me to you. Only God can say, I will be. So in the next sentence, God tells Moses the version he should say aloud, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, he has sent me to you. Now that word Yahweh is the ancient Hebrew form of the verb he will be. And this is the personal name of the God of Israel. It appears over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. Now, here's what's interesting. Over the centuries, Israelites wanted to honor the sacred nature of this divine name. So as they read the Hebrew Bible aloud and they came to this name, they stopped saying Yahweh and instead started saying the Hebrew word for Lord, which is Adonai. Now this practice has been continued throughout the centuries. And so later, when people started translating the Bible into English, they adopted the same practice. Instead of spelling out the divine name, they translated it as Lord, spelled in all capital letters. Okay, you got that? Good, because there's more. Ancient Jewish scribes wanted to prevent anyone from even accidentally saying this name aloud when you read the Hebrew Bible. And so they came up with a visual device to remind you to make sure you say Adonai. They took the four consonant letters of the divine name. These letters correspond to our English letters Y-H-W-H. Then they inserted the three vowels from the word Adonai and combined these together to create an artificial hybrid word, which if you pronounced it, it would say Yahuwah, but no Israelite ever said Yahuwah. It's simply a visual reminder to say the word Adonai. Now it gets more interesting. Much later, Christian scribes came along who didn't know that Yahuwah was an artificial word. And so they began to say it aloud and spell it in their writings. This is the word that eventually entered into English as Jehovah. It's a word many people still use today. But the main thing is the word Lord in all capital letters is an indication of the divine name. Don't confuse it with the word Lord in your English translations that's not in all capital letters. That is the actual Hebrew word Adon, which just means Lord or Master. This word can refer to people like kings or the master of a servant, even a shepherd over his sheep. And sometimes biblical authors will use this word to refer to God, like in the phrases, the Lord of all the earth or the Lord of Lords. But behind all of these words, Jehovah, Lord, Adonai, stands the original divine name of the God of Israel. It refers to the one who was, who is, and who forever will be. Woo, a lot to unpack, right? What did you, what jumped out at you through that? <laughs> we, we got it wrong, is that what you said? Anything really ring your chimes through that? A lot of names. A lot of names. A lot of names. We're going to run through some of this and some of the significance of it. So, 
He talked about it being Lord in all caps, not like we would normally look at. And if you look at these scriptures on your handout, you will see what we're talking about in all caps or what a font nerd would call small caps. I live with a font nerd, so I know these things. So in, in that top one, in verse 5, love the Lord. See how Lord is written? And it, it looks a little funny, right? Not It looks like somebody got their caps lock stuck on their typewriter. Remember that. Anytime you see the word Lord in your Bible written that way, what's really in the scripture is the personal name for God. It, it's just that's what's there. I think it's kind of neat to know that there is a personal name for God and what it is. Um, in the ancient world, names were, they were very important. They re either revealed something about someone's character. Remember when God changed Jacob's name to Israel? It was after he had wrestled with God, which is what Israel means, is wrestling with God. Or a mom in the ancient world, mothers named the children, not both parents. Mothers did that. And mothers would very often name their children based on what their expectations for that child or what their hopes for that child was. So names had tremendous importance to the ancient people. Drew has a question. Yes, Jacob was trickster or grabs by the heel or something like that. And, and his name was changed. God changed his name when he wrestled with him. It was still kind of an appropriate name, though, wasn't it? He was, he was definitely a trickster. So Yahweh, as we were told in the video, is the God of our ancestors, and it was the Third person tense, I guess. He, he is, or he will be, the God of our ancestor is who sent Moses to the Israelite people in slavery. I think it was interesting that it appears 6,500 times in Scripture. So basically, I want you to know that when you read LORD in that mixed all caps, you need to think Yahweh, the personal name of, of the divine name. And the importance to that to me is that I am or I will be, that's a statement about God's permanence that's not dependent on us or anything else. He just is. Now, the guardrails. What am I talking about with guardrails? Well, because the Jewish people considered that name so holy, they did not want to speak it. So they came up with these ways to make sure that they didn't accidentally skip over it when they were reading in scripture. They didn't say it out loud. So they came up with these other words to use instead. And one of those words was Adonai. Um, that is what, that was their word for Lord. In our Bibles, sometimes that is translated as the Almighty. So if you're looking at a passage and it's talking about God Almighty, it's talking about God Adonai. And then they also, and, and Rabbi Lizzie told us this in her video, they also used Hashem. Um, Adonai was used in scripture, so in the writings, Hashem would have been used more colloquially, the name. If they talked about God, they would call him the name. I am reflects the permanence of God outside of anything else. And also, there's another thing that the Shema tells us, and that has to do with the idea of one God. That doesn't mean just numerical. It also means relational. We have a relationship, or we can have a relationship with this one God, this Adonai, this God creator God, 
Um, there's only one of him. We only worship God by developing a special relationship to him. And the Shema is not a description of the nature of God in the universe or an ode to monotheism, but it's rather a claim about God's connection to us. It is one. Now then, this, this is one that, um, a graphic that Karen found, and I just love it. And Lizzie, Rabbi Lizzie referred to this in hers, that Yah. Weh sounds like breathing. Yahweh. Yahweh. And if we think about it, that that sound, that pronunciation, every time we breathe, every time we draw breath, we are speaking God's name. Wow. You know, sometimes what I talk about isn't that wholesome. But every time I speak, it's because God exists and gives me the breath to speak with. So I invite you to take in a deep breath and then let it out and be assured that God exists. This isn't scriptural per se, but it is something that is often used and we can use it to kind of quiet ourselves when we need to. And now we're going to look at our final video. This one again is from the um, Bible Project. There's wonderful resources at that website, um, which I, I'm going to leave this up for a minute so you can see what it is in case you want to drop down that website. Um, they have scriptural studies where they'll go through an entire book of the Bible. They have word studies. It's just wonderful. But we're going to look at the video again that goes with this series on Shema, and this is dealing with the word Ahava. Okay, Ron. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of Make expressing notes. their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the third key word in this prayer, how Israel is called to love their God. But what does that mean? Love is a very common word in most languages, as it is in ancient Hebrew. It's pronounced ahava. It most basically refers to the kind of affection or care that one person shows another. It sometimes describes physical affection, like the king of Persia's love for Queen Esther. But there are other Hebrew words that more specifically refer to physical desire or sex. Ahava is more broad. So Abraham had ahava for his son Isaac, that's parental love. Jonathan showed ahava for his friend David, that would be brotherly love. In fact, a whole group of people can have ahava for their leader, like when the Israelites showed love for their king David. Ahava can even describe loyalty between political allies, like Hiram, the king of Tyre, loved David. They had good relations, and so Hiram wanted to help David's son Solomon build the temple. These are all different kinds of affection described with the one word, ahava. Now all of this is helpful for understanding God's ahava in the Old Testament. So in Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites, God showed affection for you, he chose you because of his ahava for you. So God doesn't love because the Israelites earned it or deserve it. It simply originates from God's own character. He loves because he loves. This is why Jeremiah can say that God's love is everlasting. It has no end because it has no beginning. God's love just is an eternal fact of the universe. And God's love is not a duty. It's a genuine feeling and affection that God experiences. This is why the prophet Hosea compares God's love for his people to a husband's ahava for his wife or to a parent showing ahava for their child. It's one of the strongest things that God feels. But that doesn't mean that God's love is just a feeling. God's love is also in action. It's something God chooses to do. Like when Moses says, because of God's ahava for your ancestors, he brought you out of Egypt with great power. 
God's love isn't just a sentiment, it is something God does. And so, in the Shema, Israel is called to respond to God's Ahava by showing Ahava in return. And just like God's love, human love is to show itself through actions. Like in Deuteronomy 10, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him and serve him and to keep his commands? All of these actions are centered around love. If I'm not doing them, I don't actually love God, I just say I do. Which leads to one last thing. In the Old Testament, I show my love for God by how I treat the people around me. In Deuteronomy, we read that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he shows ahava for the immigrants among you, giving them food and clothing. And so you also show ahava for the immigrant. So the people are to imitate God's ahava by showing ahava for others. This is the idea underneath the famous line, you shall ahava your neighbor as yourself. And so at the end of the day, all of this is rooted in God's own eternal ahava. Like we read in the New Testament letter of 1 John, we love because God first loved us. And that's the Hebrew word, ahava. Okay. So now, what did you learn from that video? What? God's love always was. It originates with his character. God's love originates with his character. It is action. Anything else jump out at you? Well, let's run through this real quick. It is a word with broad and multiple meanings, much like our word love. I mean, I can say, I love my husband, which is true. I do love my husband. I can also say, I love pizza. It's not quite the same kind of love, is it? It means two entirely different things, one would hope. Um, and the Hebrew word ahava is the same way. There's a broad set of meanings. It can mean to desire or to delight in. So delighting in God and having God delight in us it can refer to parental love. It can refer to brotherly love. It can refer to a loyalty between political parties. Um, so we need to look beyond what the basic word means to what it means when God, when we're talking about God's ahava. God's ahava, and some of y'all picked up on this and jumped out at it, it has no beginning and no ending. It just is. It's always been there. Um, it isn't tied to whether or not we deserve it. God doesn't love us because we deserve to be loved. I would make the argument that most of the time we don't deserve to be loved at all, you know, but, but God's love is beyond that. His love for Israel is described over and over again, especially in the prophets, uh, in the rabbinic reading of the Song of Songs, even in the New Testament, which of course is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Greek, but we see God's love there. God loved the world so much that he sends his only son into our world. It shows action, and Barbara mentioned this, it's something God does. Um, so often, I think that we think of love, in our culture, we think of love as a feeling, and feeling love for someone. And that's true, we do, but beyond that is an action. I will never forget a sermon I heard one time uh, from Bill Self up the street at Wayuka Road Baptist Church, when he talked about it's easier to act your way into a different way of feeling than to feel your way into a different way of acting. And what he was talking about is when the Christian life gets tough and we know we need to act a certain way, maybe it's a certain way towards somebody else that's not very lovable, 
the way we do that is not to wait until we feel like doing it, but to take the action first and the feeling will follow. So I didn't keep up with my slides. <laughs> it's a command to, to love. God entails both this action and the affection. And then finally, this scripture from Deuteronomy 10, 12, walk in his way. Again, walking an action. Walk in this way. Keep commands. Serve. That's an action. And your love, you will practice what you preach. Uh, think about that the next time you have an encounter with an unlovable neighbor. We've all had unlovable neighbors from time to time. We wanted to share this quote from Rabbi Reuven Kimmelman, which really kind of sums up the Jewish understanding of what Ahava is. It's a love that is unreserved, all demanding, at all times, in all places, and in all circumstances. Nothing is excluded. Thoughts are to be focused, words are to be spoken, and deeds are to be done. Pretty tall order. But that's so what we need in the world today, is that kind of all-encompassing love. And that's what the love of God is, and we're to reflect that. Now, I want to point you back to your sheet. I want you to take this one home. I actually want you to take both of them home because I want you to stick this one up on your refrigerator because it's so pretty. And you can flip it over from time to time and look at it. But this one you'll see to consider at home. In him we live and move and have our being. Paul also encourages the Thessalonian believers to pray continuously, pray without ceasing. How can we live each hour knowing God is present and gives us being? What can we do to acknowledge and respect that? And then the other thing to think about at home, and that's why I'm saying take this home with you so you can look at it, how do you treat people around you? Spend some time contemplating this with complete honesty and ask God to help you love others with the love God shows us. And then decide on an action plan that you can take this week to show Ahava to others. Now, I invite you to stand and we're going to recite the Shema together as our benediction. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, uh, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Thank you. Go in peace. <laughs>